Let me get mine ready. All right, uh, hello from Tucson. My name is Laura Key and I'm the uh, uh, curator and associate editor at Journal of Arizona History and Arizona Historical Society. Thank you for uh, joining us uh, for this virtual program, Fighting for the Franchise, Native American Voting Rights in Arizona and Beyond. And before we uh, get our short introduction of AHS and I introduce you to uh, our panel today, uh, I first wanna say that the Arizona Historical Society acknowledges the 22 native nations that have inhabited this land from time immemorial. AHS headquarters in Tucson is located on the ancestral territories of the Tohono O'odham and the Pascua Yaqui nations. We gratefully acknowledge the native peoples on whose ancestral homelands we gather as well as the diverse and vibrant native communities who make their home here today. AHS museums and historic sites are located on ancestral territories of native peoples whose care and keeping of these lands allow us to be here today. AHS acknowledges the sovereignty of these nations and welcomes members of all native nations to our museums, libraries, and archives. All right, before we get started, I'm just gonna do a really quick introduction. Like I said, I'm Laura Key. Uh, I will be uh, helping with questions and moderating a little bit. Uh, I'm joined by Dr. David Turpey, who is the Vice President of Exhibitions, Education and Publications, uh, and editor of the Journal of Arizona History, many, many hats. And Janie Adams, who is our education team lead and museum educator and just helps us immensely with these digital uh, programs. So I wanna say thank you. Arizona Historical Society was established by the act of the first territorial legislator on November 7th, 1864. The Arizona Historical Society is Arizona's oldest historical agency and our four uh, flagship museums that you can see on the map there. Um, our mission that we take very seriously is connecting people through the power of Arizona's history uh, and which demonstrates this program will demonstrate today. And I can't go without doing a plug. We got our new license plates. So if you wanna support Arizona Historical Society and look really cool, uh, our monsoon uh, license plate is now available to, through the Department of Motor Vehicles. So take a look and I think HIST AZ is already taken. So you can't have that one. Also big news, uh, our uh, two museums, Arizona History Museum in Tucson and the Arizona Heritage Center at Papago Park in Tempe are now open from 10 a.m. to 2 p.m. So if you've been uh, holding off, come and, come and see us. Uh, we are now open as, long, as well as the archives by appointment. Um, our upcoming virtual events that we're really proud of, uh, Thursday, November 12th, we're gonna have uh, Catherine McKenna, a well-known artist, uh, talk and present some of her work uh, that you will thoroughly enjoy. Thursday, November 19th, Dr. Lydia Otero, uh, who is author of uh, her newest book of In the Shadows of the Freeway, Freeway Growing Up Brown and Queer. Uh, she's gonna talk about her book and growing up in Tucson. And uh, if you've not read the book, this would be a great introduction to it. You can visit our website uh, and calendar for more details and events and sign up and all of that good stuff, especially if you're gonna, you're gonna really like the program tonight. If you would like to support the museum even more, please become a member. Uh, help us preserve the history through our collections, exhibits, educational programs, and more. Uh, with your membership, you get an unlimited free general admission at our museums, 10% on our museum gift shop merchandise, and subscription to the award-winning Journal of Arizona History quarterly issues, and much more. So take a look. It's a great gift for holiday season, by the way. Next, we would like to, uh, with your membership, you get a uh, subscription to the Journal of Arizona History. And uh, really, if you, this is the go-to place for Arizona history if you, if you wanna learn more and uh, talk and read from the leading historians. And we've got some great issues coming up and uh, we know you're gonna like it. Again, visit our website uh, at azhs.org for the latest news and events at Arizona Historical Society. For tonight's program, uh, we have some amazing uh, historians and scholars uh, that is going to talk to you about, whoa, 
Native American voting rights uh, appropriate for this uh, season. And I'm gonna let uh, Dr. Maurice Crandall introduce everybody. But before I continue, I wanna say thank you to the Arizona Humanities and the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation for helping us put on program uh, uh, tonight's program. So thank you very much. All right, I'm gonna stop sharing and I'm going to let Dr. Crandall take over. All right. Thanks very much. Can everyone hear me? Give me a thumbs up if I'm coming through. Okay, great. Um, thank you all for joining. Uh, I know that we have people coming from a variety of time zones. I'm joining you from uh, Vermont. So it's actually uh, three hours ahead of uh, Arizona time, but um, which is actually good. The kids are in bed and asleep. So uh, I don't have to worry about uh, little ones running behind my screen or anything like that. Um, but I want to start by saying Mahamjaga uh, Gamuje. Uh, it's very nice to be here with all of you. Um, my name is Maurice Crandall, and I am a citizen of the Yavapai Apache Nation of Camp Verde, Arizona. Um, my family uh, primarily comes from the Clarkdale community, uh, which is just uh, down the hill from Jerome, if you've been up that way, really a beautiful area. And uh, I'm, I'm an assistant professor of Native American Studies at Dartmouth College. Uh, I'm a historian by training, and I work on the, the indigenous peoples of the US-Mexico borderlands, which I conceive of as, as the, the greater Southwest really, including uh, New Mexico, Arizona, Northern Mexico, um, and all that region. I published a book in 2019, which uh, talks about um, the history of indigenous uh, political participation and voting from the Spanish period through statehood, so through 1912. Um, today we'll be talking about some more contemporary issues, which I, I don't, I didn't write about in my book, um, but there are certainly things that I'm interested in. And when the Arizona Historical Society approached me about um, putting together this panel, I was extremely excited about it. It's very timely with um, what's going on today in our in our country and. Um, the upcoming election. And uh, so we need to have this discussion about Native American voting. Um, just for information, um, this is a true discussion. So I'll be mostly facilitating and asking questions of our panelists uh, who I'm, I'll introduce shortly. Uh, and, and I intend for us to, to have a, a lively discussion between us and, and I have questions that hopefully will, will inspire conversation um, that uh, range a lot of issues uh, dealing with Native American voting. Uh, and then there'll be time at the end, of course, for questions and comment from those who are, who are uh, here participating virtually as well uh, for all of you. So with that, I'm gonna give a short introduction for each of our uh, panelists. And uh, then I have a, a, a little spiel that I wanna give to lead us into our discussion. Um, so these are our, uh, our panel uh, speakers for today. Um, first, we have Judge Sierra T. Russell, who is also a citizen of the Yavapai Apache Nation. Go Yam. Um, oh, her ancestors <laughs> were indigenous to central Arizona and the Red Rocks of Sedona. Um, judge Russell is an associate appellate judge for the Salt River Pima Maricopa uh, Community Court of Appeals. Um, her, her career spans over 30 years, working with indigenous communities, largely here in the Southwest. Um, she served as a tribal council legislator, an associate tribal court and associate appellate court judge, Native American culture and gaming consultant, educator, law professor, entrepreneur, uh, and businesswoman. She's the author of Rising Over Opioid Addiction, an Indigenous Woman's Story of Childhood Trauma, Faith, and Healing, which was just published on October 1st, uh, in 2020, and is at the top of many Amazon uh, groups. Um, uh, categories. Uh, so I encourage you to, to check that out. In 2019, Judge Russell founded Indigenous Mentors, a Native American owned business designed to help uh, build, to, to build and equip an international network of high impact mentors serving Indigenous communities. Her passion is coaching, mentoring, and launching Indigenous women uh, in their God given destiny to impact the next generation. She holds a Juris Doctorate degree from UC Berkeley Law, a master's degree from Harvard and a bachelor's degree magna cum laude from Arizona State University. Uh, she's very enthusiastic about Arizona State Parks, uh, enjoys hiking and discovering the distinctive qualities of the river's wildlife and plants with her daughter, Sashin, and her granddaughter, uh, Giovanna, 
and I watch her uh, live Facebook broadcasts from Dead Horse State Park all the time. <laughs> <laughs> so it helps me feel like I'm back at home. Uh, so that's that's our first participant. Uh, next, we have Travis L. Lane, who is uh, Navajo and Southern Ute, who graduated from the University of Arizona in 2002 with a Bachelor of Arts degree in political science with a minor in American Indian Studies. After graduation, Mr. Lane was hired by the Intertribal Council of Arizona as the outreach coordinator for the Indians into Medicine program to encourage uh, American Indian youth to pursue the health, uh, pursue careers in health. Since then, he's held numerous roles and responsibilities at the ITCA. In 2014, he was appointed as assistant director. Uh, and in this capacity, he assists in overseeing the operations and policy developments of the organization, which includes managing a budget of $19 million and supervising a staff of 60. He oversees all the voter engagement and census work at ITCA, uh, another great organization with a wonderful history, which I uh, highly recommend. Um, next, we have Kathleen Cahill. Uh, Kathleen D. Cahill received her PhD at the University of Chicago. She taught at the University of New Mexico for 13 years, which is where we met. I uh, got my PhD at UNM. Uh, before moving to Penn State, where she's now an associate professor of history, she's the author of Recasting the Vote, How Women of Color Transformed the Suffrage Movement, uh, out from the University of North Carolina Press, just hot off the press, just, just came out. Uh, her first book, Federal Fathers and Mothers, A Social History of the United States Indian Service, 1869 to 1933, came out with UNC Press in 2011. It won the Labriola Center uh, for American Indian National Book Award right here in, uh, in, in Phoenix, um, and uh, was finalist for the David J. Weber and Bill Clements Book Prize. This year, she co-edited a special suffrage issue for the Journal of the Gilded Age and Progressive Era with Kimberly Hamlin and Crystal Feimster. She's also a uh, steering committee chair for the Coalition for Western Women's History. And then last, we have uh, Daniel McCool, who's a professor emeritus of political science uh, at the University of Utah, has one of the greatest names, Daniel McCool. Um, professor McCool's research focuses on water resources, Indian voting and water rights, and public lands policy. His books include River Republic, The Fall and Rise of America's Rivers, with Columbia University Press in 2012, The Most Fundamental Right, Contrasting Perspectives on the Voting Rights Act with Indiana University Press in 2012, an edited volume, uh, Native Vote, American Indians, The Voting Rights Act and Indian Voting with Cambridge in 2007, which he co-authored and which for me was an extremely important work as I uh, did my own research. Uh, and Native Waters, Contemporary Indian Water Settlements and the Second Treaty Era with U of A Press 2002. Uh, his most recent book was a uh, co-edited volume called Vision and Place, John Wesley Powell and Reimagining the West with the University of California Press in 2020. And uh, importantly for today's discussion, he co-authored the 2020 report on Native American voting obstacles at every turn, barriers to political participation faced by Native voters, which was done uh, through NARF, which I highly recommend also. Uh, he served as an expert witness in 17 voting rights cases. So that is our uh, panel for today. Um, and I need to take a little drink of water. So like I said, we're going to start in with a discussion very shortly. Um, I want to um, start with a, with a short story. Um, as indigenous people, we are, we are uh, narrative based and, and like to tell stories. So I wanna tell you all a little bit of the, the story of Indian voting in Arizona. Um, as it was told to me and with some additional um, bits of information. But uh, I think it's important to lead in with this since this is the Arizona Historical Society and this is a, a discussion about Indian voting in Arizona and, and the Southwest and beyond. And our discussion will be much more expansive than just Arizona, but we'll, we'll begin here. Uh, so I wanna start by telling you all that the Howell Code, which was the, the first legal apparatus um, approved by the Arizona Legislative Assembly in 1864, after Arizona became its own territory, um, split from New Mexico. Uh, it's stated in chapter 24, section six, every white male citizen of the United States and every white male citizen of Mexico 
who shall have elected to become a citizen of the United States under the Treaty of Peace, uh, exchanged and ratified at Quintero on the 30th day of May, 1848, which is of course the Treaty of Guadalupe Hidalgo, and the Gazan Treaty of 1854, of the age of 21 years, who shall have been a resident of the territory six months next preceding the election, and the county or precinct in which he claims his vote 10 days shall be entitled to vote at all elections which are now or hereafter may be authorized by law. So just to point out that the first governing document for the territory of Arizona um, based voting on whiteness. It had to be a white uh, man as well. So white males could vote. So Indians were uh, explicitly barred from voting uh, under the, the Howell Code. Uh, when Arizona was admitted to the Union in 1912, its state constitution uh, explicitly barred non-white persons and therefore Native Americans from voting as well, um, continued to exclude Native peoples even after Congress passed the Indian Citizenship Act a dozen years later in 1924, which gave birthright citizenship to Native Americans and ostensibly the vote. Uh, it was four years later in 1928 that two citizens of the Gila River Indian community where Sierra is a, a judge, um, put this to the, to the test uh, and attempted to vote in the next presidential election after Indian citizenship had been granted. Uh, their names were Peter Porter and Rudolph Johnson. And when they went to register uh, the county registrar's office to exercise this you know, newly won uh, right, they were turned away and the registration was refused. So then the question was, how could people whose uh, citizenship rights had been granted by a congressional act uh, be kept from voting? Uh, the answer was that they were considered wards of the federal government and under guardianship uh, and wardship. Uh, according to Article 7, Section 2 of the Arizona State Constitution, um, it read, no person under guardianship, non compos mentis or insane shall be qualified to vote at any election. So in other words, the state of Arizona classed Indians with um, the mentally insane and institutionalized persons uh, and considered them under guardianship. Arizona was certainly uh, in well shod um, constitutional territory because the, uh, the Supreme Court's Cherokee decisions um, famously stated Cherokee Nation v. Georgia in 1831, Chief Justice uh, John Marshall, who authored the majority opinion stated, there, meaning the Cherokees, and then by extension, all Indians, uh, relation to the United States resembles that of a ward to his guardian. So as Arizona reasoned, if Indians were wards of the federal government, um, and they must be since a federal agency, the Bureau of Indian Affairs oversaw um, their affairs, then they were not uh, officially citizens um, and could not vote in Arizona. Um, Porter and Johnson uh, took the, the, the case to court uh, and in the Porter v. Hall decision of November 1928, the Arizona Supreme Court upheld the legality of the state's denial of Indian voting rights and therefore uh, made Native Americans in Arizona, if they were citizens, non-voting non citizens. Um, it would be 20 years later exactly in 1948 that uh, the Porter decision was challenged in a, in a significant and meaningful way in 1948 when um, World War II Marine Corps veterans uh, or veteran uh, Frank Harrison, who was uh, a Fort McDowell Yavapai, that's our, our sister tribe just outside of Phoenix, um, and the then tribal chair Harry Austin uh, tried to register in Maricopa County. Um, Harrison was motivated by a sense of, of um, we we'll call it uh, righteous indignation at coming home and seeing his people as second-class citizens uh, and himself after he had you know, sacrificed for his country uh, in, in the recent war. Um, and when they went to register to vote, uh, the county registrar, Roger Levine, refused them, giving the same reply as uh, had, had been given before to Peter Porter, uh, that they were under wardship of the government uh, and therefore couldn't vote in Arizona. Um, this time, when the, the case went to court and Harrison sued Levine, the registrar, uh, they received support from the National Congress of American Indians. Uh, Felix Cohen wrote an amicus brief. Uh, they had um, um, widespread support uh, and, and the situation had changed quite a bit. Um, and in 1948, on July 15th, the Arizona Supreme Court handed down the Harrison v. Levine decision. Uh, ruling that the court had erred 
um, 20 years previous and denying Peter Porter and Rudolph Johnson the franchise. Uh, Arizona could lo no longer deny um, Indians voting and full citizenship. Uh, although there certainly have been um, obstacles to voting in the time since 1948, by no means has it been uh, full and easy enfranchisement for native people. Um, but I wanted to give that backstory so that we understand where we are in Arizona, um, the, the place where we're, we're principally talking about and originating today. Uh, and then as we move forward with this discussion, um, we'll consider a lot of other things, but, but that is a little bit of backstory if you didn't know about the history of Indian voting in Arizona. And that's a, that's a, a brief summary. So I wanna start our discussion today, um, maybe asking uh, Dan uh, if you could just kind of generally um, give us an overview of the history of, of native voting kind of more broadly and, and perhaps um, some ways that Native, American, Native Americans have been enfranchised and have been disenfranchised. Um, just kind of a general idea so that we know uh, more broadly what we're talking about. How long do you want me to talk and what is our audience? Who, who, who am I speaking to? So our audience includes, uh, from what I've seen, um, academics, also community members, uh, indigenous people. Uh, it, it it runs the range, so it's it's a, a, a broad audience. And I would say, um, for any of our answers, we shouldn't take more than a, a few minutes. Oh, okay. Well, if the, you can uh, summarize in a couple minutes. Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I, uh, I keep a running tally of voting rights cases where Native Americans are either the plaintiff or they have a direct interest in the case. And uh, I think we're up to a, 110 now. So uh, summarizing that will be a little difficult, but yeah. um, initially the cases as you described were uh, vote denial cases where Native people simply weren't allowed to vote even though they were uh, citizens. And uh, I think the last state uh, to deny natives the right to vote was my home state of Utah and the year was 1957. And almost always it was either the threat of litigation or in the case of Arizona, as you mentioned, uh, successful litigation with the Arizona Supreme Court. In 1948, it, native people got the right to vote in successful federal uh, court litigation. So it, it takes court cases that, and the, that 110 starts with the cases to fight the actual denial of the right to vote. The subsequent cases are all about the dilution or abridgment of the right to vote. Mm -hmm. So it, if you have the right to vote, but you don't have a polling place, or you've been gerrymandered to the point where it's impossible to elect a candidate of your choice, you've effectively been disenfranchised. And since about the, the mid 60s, especially with the, the initial passage of the Voting Rights Act in 1965, the cases have been about uh, vote dilution or the abridgment of the right to vote. And then starting in 1975 with an amendment to the, uh, to the Voting Rights Act, we can include on that list the requirement for language assistance. And of course, that, that's also required a, a number of lawsuits over time. So it's a, it's a long, complex history. Out of those 110 cases, the Native American plaintiffs either won or settled to their satisfaction about 90% of them, 90%. That's a stunning record of success. Great. Uh, so, so the courts have been a fruitful avenue, uh, we could say, um, in, in a number of ways. It, until, yes, until recently, it's, sure. it's getting a little tougher. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and could continue to be tough with uh, yeah. our court as it stands. Yes. yes. So a few things um, strike me, and I, I've looked at a number of these cases and, and through them and then um, historically, they've often involved Native American men um, and questions of citizenship 
have often re revolved around uh, Native American men because uh, you know the fr enfranchisement is often tied to to being a man um, and and citizenship. Definitely before 1924 and and before that, before the 19th Amendment, often was was about men. So I want to turn to Kathleen. Is there there has to be a place for Native American women in this conversation? So if Native women aren't the famous court cases like like uh, Porter or uh, Miguel Trujillo in New Mexico or others. Um, how do they figure into this conversation? Yeah, thanks, Maurice. That's a that's a really good question. And when I first started writing about suffragists, um, I definitely thought, well, most of these court cases are brought by men. Um, so I think there's uh, the the place that I've found most fruitful is thinking about how Native women were theorizing about voting rights. Um, so the 19th Amendment um, is ratified in 1920, and it's important to remember what that amendment actually says. It doesn't grant suffrage to all women. It merely says that the right to vote cannot be denied on the basis of sex. Um, so you can't use the category of woman to deny people the right to vote, but you can still use the category of ward, right, which is what happens to Native women. Um, and I don't think that it's a coincidence that two major um, Native women who are advocates of the right to vote and of US citizenship in conjunction with tribal sovereignty, um, kind of a dual citizenship, um, both publish major pieces of what I would say are political theory. So in 1920, Laura Cornelius Kellogg, who's a Wisconsin Oneida woman, publishes um, a book called Our Democracy and the American Indian, which is a really sweeping um, vision of um, how a native nation can um, kind of move forward into modernity um, in, as a nation, right? This is the moment when, as you mentioned, um, the federal government is emphasizing assimilation, um, the destruction of tribal governments. Um, and uh, so, so Kellogg is saying, how can my nation, the Wisconsin Oneida, save its land base, which was rapidly disappearing because of allotment, and maintain um, its own governance, right? And so she writes a um, hundred and something page book, um, imagining um, how that might look Right, and the relationship with the federal government. And, and I think there are two things that are particularly interesting about it. One, she says, she imagines it as a corporation, right? This is a moment in American history when corporations are sort of the new thing. Um, and she says, look, you know, Americans really like corporations and those are sort of joint holding companies, right? So we can imagine tribal sovereignty as a corporation as, and native, um, all of the citizens as corporate shareholders and everybody gets one vote, right? So all citizens of the tribal nation would get one vote. Um, and then she also calls in that book as well as in her speeches on newly enfranchised white women who got the vote in 1920 to um, help uh, fight for native women to um, and, and native men to be recognized as citizens um, and to help them put this plan into place. The other woman that um, also publishes in 1921, the next year is uh, Gertrude Bonin or Zitkalasa, uh, Yangtan Dakota woman, Yangtan Sioux Nation. And uh, she publishes American Indian stories, which um, usually is, right, it's a set of kind of semi-autobiographical stories where she moves from childhood through to teaching in the Indian service, um, but that were meant to be really critical of federal assimilation policy. And she's drawing on her own experiences to do that. But the last piece in there is called America's Indian Problem. And it's really more of a, an essay that, again, is very critical of the federal bureaucracy. Both of those women worked for the Indian service. Both had firsthand experience of how wardship was not working, right? And that Native resources were not being protected. And they were calling for change. Um, but that essay is actually a reworking of a piece that she, of a speech she gave um, to the National Women's Party, which is Alice, Paul, uh, Alice Paul's group, right? The women who were picketing the White House. And again, she's urging um, newly enfranchised white women to help native people uh, uh, get to a place where she likes to contrast bureaucracy with democracy. Um, and that democracy meant tribal sovereignty and self-governance 
And again, for both of the women, that the question of land rights was really at the center of all of that. So um, it's interesting, you can see that legacy of uh, tribal corporations persisting into the Indian Reorganization Act that were conceived of as, as corporations, right, that we can incorporate uh, through IRA and then become tribal corporations. And, and um, even, you know, a lot of tribal councils are known as business councils. I mean, the Isleta Council is the business council. And so, that, yeah, this, this, uh, these ideas are, are prevalent. Um, so, okay, so taking this, uh, Indigenous women um, as activists seeking allies among white women, um, and, and I would assume white men as well, uh, sort of the, the old friends of the Indian channels, maybe, even if they hadn't proved fruitful. Right, yeah, actually a little bit. Um, both of them in their speeches are definitely talking to white women, but um, the General Federation of Women's Clubs, where Bonin actually finds some strong allies, they don't always find allies, but she does there. Um, and they do work with the Indian Defense Association um, mm. and um, yeah, the, what's the other big one? Uh, not the Commissioner of Indian Affairs, but yeah, those, those groups. Yeah. For sure. yeah, 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 sure. Okay, okay. So now we're gonna make a leap um, and, and looking at the Intertribal Council of Arizona as sort of a, a pan-Indian legacy of that type of activism, which, you know, early progressive era activism is, is the, the, what initiates this call to pan-Indian um, uh, organizations like the, the Society of American Indians and then the NCAI later, and now the ITCA, which is Arizona specific. Travis, you've been involved heavily in voter initiatives. Um, bringing this a little bit more to the present, um, wh what have your experiences been with Native American voting with initiatives to get um, indigenous people more fully enfranchised and in Arizona, but then that extends as well because you were in those hearings for NARF, which uh, you know were held in a number of locations. Um, could you maybe t tell us some of your experiences with with uh, with that? Sure, and thank you for inviting me um, to this prestigious panel. Um, Judge Russell, it's an honor to be on a panel with you and also with Dan, who's <laughs> such an expert in, in the native vote. And, and Ms. Cahill, uh, it's an honor to meet you and the same with Mr. Crandall. Um, ITCA produced a video back in the early 1980s called The History of Indian Rights in Arizona. It's on our YouTube page, so please take some time to review it. And when I first was hired by, by ITCA, uh, I saw that video and I had no idea the history of the voting rights that had occurred in Arizona and the fight for, for, um, the, for voting rights in Arizona. And I, that, after that, I drank the juice and I've been a, an advocate for, for the native vote ever since. And um, it came at a time when uh, back in the early 2000s, there was a proposition that was passed, Prop 200, which requires um, proof of citizenship to register to vote and proof of um, location in order to cast a ballot. And, and that with what we saw when the, after that, um, that proposition passed was a decrease in voter participation in tribal communities. We also saw um, a lot of uh, a, a poll worker uh, training that was not properly trained in uh, recognizing tribal ID um, there was a lot of issues with non-traditional addresses uh, with, our, with our people because we don't have um, street addresses in many of our tribal communities. And then of course, we um, all have always seen that the counties were not compliant under section 203 of the Voting Rights Act, which is to provide language assistance in um, uh, tribal and non-tribal languages. And at the time, there was about nine, language, nine tribal languages covered under section 203 according to what they used to call the long survey of the US Census Bureau, but now they call the American Community Survey. So we, can, we still continue to see some of these problems today. And so it is a lot of voter education and um, our people still feel disenfranchised. They don't wanna participate in the American governmental system because they don't trust um, that their vote's gonna count. They're gonna get denied the right to vote and they don't see that um, who we elect is actually representing the interest of our communities. 
and we still continue to struggle with voting uh, people who come from our communities into these important elected offices. So um, the struggle still continues today. Um, we've, ITCA, of course, uh, may be familiar with the US Supreme Court um, decision that we were involved with, which allowed the recognition of the federal form to um, use as um, sufficient um, verification of citizenship, although um, there was uh, you know, a decision in Arizona to prevent the ability that if you did use the federal form, you don't, could only vote in federal elections. Mm -hmm. And so we still continue to see uh, efforts um, in Arizona to disenfranchise the Native American participation in our electoral system. Mm -hmm. You've touched on a lot of points, a lot of important points. Um, voter ID uh, uh, restrictions, which are, are prevalent all over the, I mean, there was the North Dakota, you know, cases that have been um, uh, kind of in the top of, of the native vote disenfranchisement, but it, it's all over. Polling places being distant, um, language materials not being there, address uh, issues, not living near a post office. I mean, there are so many things. I wanna ask Sarah, as, as a, both um, a, a uh, indigenous, you know, legal scholar, attorney judge, but also as a, a tribal leader, you know, you're on tribal council. Mm -hmm. um, what, what did you see as uh, impediments to Native American voting or political participation? You know, um, Travis talked about this kind of distrust of, you know, the, either the federal government or the outside communities. I mean, what were your observations in, in those regards? Well, thank you, Dr. Crandall. I, I do also want to say I appreciate being um, invited to sit on this very honored uh, panel. And so I just want to thank you. I think that uh, Travis, when he talked about trust, that is one of the biggest um, realities that I experienced uh, as, a, as a community member, as a citizen of the Yavapai Apache Nation, and then sitting as an elected leader in council and seeing and, and understanding both from an academic place, the, the, the relationship that was established through the uh, Supreme Court cases that you referred to earlier, the um, Johnson Supreme Court cases, Marshall's cases, and that wardship uh, status that was uh, we were placed into in the 1830s. And so that has carried over to um, having an existence day to day where we as a people, we struggle to find our place in the societies, especially in our local communities. And the trust issue, of course, it it's probably goes without uh, needing to delineate but being not trusted to manage our own affairs, that's why sovereignty is so critical and, and that self-determination that finally was a door to allow us as First Nations people to begin to you know, govern ourselves, to determine who could be members of our community, to begin to build our infrastructure. And so it's, taken, it's taking time to get to a place of self-sufficiency in many of the Indian nations in, in, in our country and in our state. So being able to see yourself as benefiting and having an impact directly into the leadership that governor, governs your existence on a day-to-day -day basis. In my experience as a council member, just having our own community members uh, being able to see why their one vote is so critical to who is elected into those positions from the chairperson to the vice to the legislative branch. Uh, understanding that their vote makes a difference. That is a continual effort and it needs to be intentional by the different Indian nations. And, and some nations are very successful in doing that. When you think about what's happening right now in our, in our nation, right? You can't get away almost from all the blast about get out and vote, vote for this party's person, vote for this one. And it's constant constant for some of us really don't want to hear it anymore. But the point is there has to be a deliberate and intentional ongoing effort to bring to the awareness of citizens what, what is important about voting, why it's 
important and just a con consult a unified approach to that and unfortunately for many indian nations the resources are very limited and it's hard to gan garner that type of resource to actually push for um why voting is so key and then of course as already mentioned where do they go and mail this where do, how do you get information to a lot of the community members just trying to get somebody to vote for me when I was running for office is how do you let people, individual families know that, you know, what you're about, what's the value of supporting a particular uh, person running for an office? That's a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you're right. I mean, rock, we see rock the vote all the time and in particular rock the native vote. I mean, that that is is out there. and. In some ways, I think that we're seeing um, a political kind of awakening in Indian country. And I have to say that um, much of it is women led. I mean, if we look at Deb Holland and Sharice Davids um, and um, I forget her name, she's in Idaho running for Senate uh, and could be the first Native American Senator. Mm -hmm. um, oh, her name escapes me, but uh, there, there's there's a lot of activity, there's a lot of synergy around Native American voting, um, and and a lot of what's at the the forefront of that is is women um, participating in in uh, in these activities. Well, what I want to ask here is, um, and this is to everybody, all of our panelists, um, what's important to a Native American voter historically, maybe. Uh, 50 years ago, 25 years ago, today, looking to the future? I mean, wh what are the issues that matter to Native American voters? Because I think that we have to differentiate what a Native voter votes about isn't always what you know a mainstream voter uh, cares about. So, I, I mean, this is open to any of the panelists. What do you think are the, the important issues and have been the important issues historically? Are they the same? Are we always talking about sovereignty or have these evolved and changed over time? I'll open it to anyone. Anyone can can respond. I, I would like to uh, uh, offer some one uh, understanding that I I recently became more cognizant of, and that has to do with uh, a segment of our native population across our country. How um, a significant segment are concerned and have reason to be about religious freedom and the right to practice. Um, their religion in the way that they that honors their own beliefs and so i think that's an area where if if there was more uh discussion or directed approach to the citizens native american citizens about how their vote and and who's actually representing their their vote who cares about whether or not uh native americans get religious freedom they have the right to practice how they they um, mm -hmm. choose. And okay. I think if there is a segment, and I'm going to differentiate for purposes of this discussion, but when you look at a certain segment of the mainstream society, and I also am part of that segment, which would be Christians, and their concern about their religious freedoms being abridged or stymied, especially during this COVID time, and uh, the right to worship and, and, and to go to church and gather, and the, those are First Amendment, right? So. Um, I think that's an important area that uh, that's very similar for Native Americans that practice more traditional religious practices and their right to be able to do that free of any possible charges or criminalities. Sure. Yeah, indigenous, I think religious freedom has, has been a and key issue for a long time. The, the conversation, I noticed over the years that education, that when, when Native people can see how voting affects the local community, that that's when they want to get, that's when they want to participate. And so uh, election into school boards to ensure that there are, there's Native representation in school boards is yeah. really important because um, it's their own families that are running for these, for these positions. And they see that education has a um, direct effect on, on the children that are being taught within their communities. But on a, on a national level, I think I want to uh, mention uh, issues around uh, the protection of sacred places. So we yeah. have the Dakota Access Pipeline that I think really gave rise 
um, to the importance of, of uh, protecting our land, our, our tribal land. And, and we do have issues in Arizona as well with uh, resolution copper affecting the San Carlos oh, Drive, the Rosemont mine expansion that's affecting the Tonawatam Nation. We have uranium happening up in, Grand, in the Grand Canyon region affecting the, have the quality of water for the Havasupai tribe. So I think mm -hmm. that's uh, bringing a, a large cause to realize how much um, state and national uh, leaders make these decisions. And then the last one I wanted to mention was missing and murdered indigenous yes. women. That has yep. definitely been um, on the forefront of conversations across the nation and including in Arizona that our, our, our women are being silenced and no longer do our women um, should be silenced in these uh, very violent acts that occur by oftentimes non-Indian men. Yeah. So, Dan, you you made reference to something. So let's let's talk about local elections. When Native people feel like their vote affects local conditions and things in their everyday lives, then they're they're more apt to participate. So school board elections. I mean, I read the report, Dan, that you you helped co-author, and and um, there's uh, what is it packing and. Uh, uh, it's too gerryman gerrymandering. Yeah, yeah. Hacking and cracking. Right. Exactly. Exactly. So, so like a school board, the, the case that was mentioned is in um, Apache uh, County that, you know, the, all of the native population is put in one district when, you know, they greatly outnumber all of the population in the entire county. And yet they're going to be one third represented basically when it, it shouldn't be that way. I mean, so how, how do we fight against those kinds of, of issues that diminish our, our political power? Uh, the first step is litigation. That's why there's been so many cases. Uh, yep. You, you have to fight them. And now that we don't have section five and preclearance, that sometimes means that, they pass a bad law and you sue them successfully. And like in the North Dakota voter ID case, um, they just come back and pass another bad law and you have to sue yeah, them all yeah. over again. Uh, the second thing to do about it is to vote. It's to organize and vote. And native turnout is still, it's better than it was. It's still lower than especially if you compare it to their white rural counterparts. And especially in local elections and sometimes at the state level and in sometimes under certain conditions in Senate and House races, uh, mm -hmm. the native vote can make a difference. But it, it uh, politicians respond when they think native people are going to either vote for them or against them in a block and they're a sufficient number that they can make a difference in the race. Yeah. So uh, increasing turnout increases visibility and basically the threat level so that politicians start looking at natives and say, I, I just can't take these people for granted anymore. Uh, okay. they're, they're not gonna vote for me. And if they all gang up on me, I could lose the next election so sure yeah I, I feel like a I mean I, I'm a I'm an advocate of voting right so I, yeah. I think that's <laughs> that that's one of the great solutions uh, sure to many of our problems Kathleen did you you, you were raising your hand you have a comment yeah on. I just wanted to kind of piggyback on that point um, with a historical example which is in 1924 after Indian Citizenship Act passes Gertrude Bonin is really excited and um, she publishes a pamphlet that's in her papers at BYU that shows the native population in certain states, right? Mostly Western states um, <laughs> to show that, you know, there is the possibility of this native voting block, right? And if they all voted together, they could really, as, as you were saying, Dan, um, change politics. And what you also see it precisely that, and, and and she starts traveling around to different reservations that each summer she and her husband travel to try to register voters and get them to vote. 
And I, I always think like, what could she have done with the internet, right? <laughs> because yeah. she's doing it all pen and paper and, and travel. But um, what you also see at precisely the same time is in the 1920s, between 24 and 28, so many headlines talking about you know, what is gonna be the impact of the Indian vote um, in, again, in the very same states that she um, sees as possibility. And so there is absolutely a sense that if native people all voted in Oklahoma, in the Dakotas, in Montana, in Arizona, New Mexico, Alaska, right? They could have a powerful impact. And that's also when you see um, new ways of disenfranchising native people um, go into effect, right? In the post 24 mm -hmm. period. So mm -hmm. yeah, that, yeah, I just wanted to reinforce that, that that is exactly what Gertrude Bonin is hoping will happen. I, the figures that I that I read were, um, and, and Dan had mentioned, you know, the, the proportion of Native people that are potential voters that actually vote, it's like two thirds are registered voters right now. It's like 66%. So um, out of a total population that those who aren't voting that could among the Native pop population of the United States is, is over a million voters. And in a place like Oklahoma, Arizona, New Mexico, the Dakotas, Alaska, uh, Maine, Michigan, a determined voting block of native people could easily swing an election. So this, this counters that idea of what does my vote matter, right? That, that you know, there's just one of me or our communities uh, are small. And so um, it, it really is important that uh, Native people realize collectively that there is power in voting. And if Gertrude Bonin is making that point in the 1920s, you know, like it's, the Native population has only grown since then, you know, significantly. I mean, the, the, we're many millions compared to what we were at that point, you know, 1900 is considered kind of the, the nadir in terms of Native population. So um, maybe that realization. So I want to ask a question, uh, this made me think of something. Is there a difference between what urban Indian voters want and reservation Indians? Um, we we've, we've kind of made that historical distinction, and then you know through the through the era of termination and relocation, um, you know Travis, you you I I'm guessing live and work in the Phoenix area, which is a an area of many tens of thousands of Native people. Um, Sierra, our our region is is a little more sparsely populated, but you know. Native population alongside, you know, non-native population. Is there a difference between the rural and the urban native voter, um, and and what's important to to them, or how you go about um, motivating and mobilizing that vote? Yeah, the message um, that we need to share with all native people and native communities throughout, whether you're in an urban setting or not, or in a tribal setting, is that participation is important. But the difference is that how you participate, it's gonna look different whether you're in an urban setting or a, a tribal or rural setting. So um, registering to vote online may not be a, a solution for if you live in a tribal community because of the digital divide, but that might be uh, an option for um, if you live in the Flagstaff, Phoenix and Tucson areas. Um, a lot of our native people may be living um, in, in Phoenix, um, you know, nine months of the year or just during Monday through Friday, but they have their home back in a tribal community. So they might not, they might, they might still be registered in their tribal community, but live in the Phoenix or, or the urban areas in Arizona. So the idea of having to request an absentee ballot is really important for our communities because they want to vote what they know is going to affect their tribal community and not necessarily affect the vote um, where they're residing for work. Mm. However, it is a trade-off. If your kids are going to a public school in Phoenix, then you can't make those, you can't participate in making those decisions of who's going to represent them on school boards uh, for their children if you're registered back on the Thon Autumn Nation or White Mountain. So um, it's it's a we're a transient community, and so I'm not I'm not necessarily aware of where there's the distinction between an urban a person urban in a living area or a tribal community. 
because every every situation is different, and we come across yeah. these situations um, all the time. Um, certainly, if you're in an urban area, you're not guaranteed language assistance uh, under Section 203, but you would be guaranteed. You should have been guaranteed that if you live in the Navajo Nation or San Carlos Apache Tribe. Um, so yeah. it's it's a it's it's a hard one to generalize. Um, yeah. That, that, that yeah. question. Because each nation is so different as well. I mean, you know, we're all distinct, uh, several hundred distinct tribal nations which, with distinct political traditions as well. Um, so, I'm, you know, it, I, I want to have a um, uh, you know, nonpartisan discussion as much as it's possible, but, but, you know, we have to admit that currently Native people are voting, uh, tend to vote more Democrat than Republican right now. I mean, if you look at the, the national numbers, um, you know, that they're more Democrat than Republican. It hasn't always been the case historically, though. I mean, um, if we look at, you know, uh, um, Charles Curtis, who is uh, Hoover's vice president, and he's a Republican. Yeah, um, and you know, Mike Burns, who Mathia is a Yavapai in Arizona, is one of the first voters there in, in the territory in the early part of the, the 1900s. He, he's a Democrat sometimes, he's a Republican other times. And um, do, what do we see kind of along the political divide? What were Native women, were they Republicans or Democrats in, in the 1920s? I mean, how do we make this more complex than just a Republican Democrat um, issue, both historically and right now? I mean, what do you what do you see? Uh, anyone? Well, I'll just say that, um, yeah, uh, Curtis used to say, "I'm one eighth Ka and one hundred percent Republican." This was his. <laughs> <laughs> And he actually um, plays a really important role. Um, he's known as a supporter of women's rights broadly. Um, and he is a good friend of the National Women's Party. And he's the one that introduces the Equal Rights Amendment on the floor of the Senate for the first time while he's serving as Senator um, hmm. for um, Kansas. So that's 1923. And then yeah. the National Women's Party actually endorses the, the Republican ticket in 28 because of him. Um, so Gertrude Bonin, again, is very excited by his um, nomination. She, she writes to congratulate him, but then she also sends um, sort of a survey to both Hoover and then he's running against the Democrat Al Smith, right? First Catholic um, nominee. And um, she doesn't hear from Hoover. And so while she is very excited about Curtis and she gets really outraged when the two um, men are denied the right to vote in Arizona in 28, um, she actually, she and her um, organization, National Council of American Indians, actually endorsed Smith because John Collier is working for Smith and writes a pretty robust response to her. Now, Laura Cornelius Kellogg <laughs> never apparently liked uh, Hoover and potentially Curtis. Um, and she um, stumped for Al Smith throughout the upper Midwest in Michigan and Wisconsin. So absolutely, right? Native people, Native women, um, very much like white women, while people expected there might be a women's block um, that mm -hmm. all women would kind of vote the same way. There were ideas about women being different from men and therefore they would all vote in one way. That doesn't manifest for white women or for Native women. They're very much... Yeah. Uh, begin to work through those parties. Yeah, well, I mean, even in Arizona, my my grandpa loved Goldwater and Nixon. Uh, well, I mean, Barry Goldwater is sort of the the close ties to Native communities and and sort of old boy politician. Um, but Nixon, it was always because of self determination ending, you know, the the termination era and, and ushering in self determination. So so Nixon is the the kind of golden boy from that era. But, you know, is it, I think it's too simplistic to say that we're seeing a, sort of a generational shift now and it's maybe more Democrat, but could we see something different um, among, you know, native uh, communities in, in terms of, you know, political participation or, or are, we, are we sort of solidly Democrat um, for the foreseeable future? Any thoughts? I can, uh just comment on the case law that's occurred. Uh, in the past, the defendants in these cases tend to be both uh, Republicans and Democrats. 
uh, supporters of the Voting Rights Act and the amendments over time, the renewals, were bipartisan. The last time it was renewed in 2006, it had broad bipartisan support. The last three um, renewals were all signed by Republican presidents. And unfortunately, that era is over. And there's virtually no Republican support today for the, the Shelby Fix bill. But uh, again, there's a, a few exceptions. Mm -hmm. most, of the, uh, most of the conflicts that are going on in, in court today, the defendants are Republicans or the Republican party. Uh, and the entire electoral process has become a partisan wedge issue, which I, I think is a, a really unfortunate development, but um, that's the reality of the partisan world that we live, live in today. So if, if you look at the ongoing cases or the cases that have been litigated just in the last three or four months, they, and by the way, there's, there's something like 400 different lawsuits over the electoral process during this election cycle and probably more than all the other elections put together uh, in many, many cases, not all of them, uh, it's Democrats versus Republicans. Yeah, yeah. I, I would just add that I think both parties have been very silent about catering to the Native American people as yeah. far as um, their, their issues that they um, promote um, in Arizona. Um, but at the same time, both parties have had shown examples of progress for Native issues. Um, uh, Senator McCain was a staunch advocate for Native children. Um, he, he passed a lot of laws that was there to protect, protect children. I think the, um, the Adam Walsh Act's first iteration back in the 80s actually came from a bill that McCain passed to protect um, what was going on up on the Hopi tribe with the, with the sex offender registry. Um, mm -hmm. Of course, Obama was um, very progressive in passing very native friendly bills like um, the Violent, Violence Against Women Act, which allowed for um, uh, tribal jurisdiction over non-Indians who commit violence against women, uh, which was a very key um, uh, act to have passed during his legislation. Um, I think when when we, when Native people start participating, then the parties will listen to us. But right now, they don't see that, and I and I and I want I want both parties to fight for our interests, whether it's in elections or during uh, a legislative season. I want our either party to fight for our interests and that they yeah. vote for us. Um, yeah. But we're not there yet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And for, for neither party to, to sort of take Native support for granted, you know, the Democratic Party cannot just take the Native vote for granted. Um, uh, yeah, both need to have sort of a reckoning if we could just mobilize. So we're, we're close to the end of our, just, oh yeah, go ahead, Dan. And uh, I, I might add when I'm talking about Democrats and Republican in these lawsuits, I'm talking about the party structure not yeah. individual Democrats and Republicans and not individual legislators. There, sure. uh, as Travis pointed out, and this, this is a long held tradition, there have been uh, legislators on both sides, senators, congressmen, and, and in state legislatures uh, that are Democrats or Republicans that are very pro-Indian. So you, we, we can't categorize uh, the rank and file or individuals by that characterization of the parties. The parties in these lawsuits are generally a secretary of state or it's actually the DNC or the RNC or, or some representative of those organizations. So it's, sure. it's the organized okay. party structure. Yeah, yeah. Okay, well, we are um, 
about at the end of our discussion time, I sort of wanna end with one question, which uh, it may be a little selfish because it comes from my own work and ideas. So um, when does the, is it um, a valid political strategy by native people to refuse to participate? Um, because these are settler institutions and they're not born of our own traditions. And um, by voting, we are supporting um, colonialism and imperialism. So, so, you know, I'm thinking of historically Haudenosaunee, the, the women reformers who are, you know, trying to solve the Indian problem are meeting in upstate New York and Haudenosaunee territory where there's an explicit rejection of uh, the nation state. Um, and then, you know, Ton Autumn's, uh, you know, rejecting that sort of strict citizenship along the US-Mexico border, Pueblo peoples, you know, saying we don't want to be citizens on, on numerous occasions. So when is it, um, it, it is that a, a valid polit political strategy or, or, you know, can it be? It might not be something that we could, you know, address right now, but um, any thoughts on that? Any thoughts on refusing the vote? I have a comment on that. Mm -hmm. uh, I, you know, I, my question would be then what is the alternative? If, if we're a group is choosing to, for those reasons you said, you know, just didn't want to buy into this uh, colonialism listic system, then how do they get to the table? Because that is one understanding that's real solid, I believe in, in our community. Uh, and I think most of the 22 and all the other tribal nations, when you get into a leadership position, meaning you're in a position to speak on behalf of your community because your community citizenry has determined that you should speak for them. And when you go to like DC, when we go to Washington DC, especially with uh, Intertribal Council of, of uh, Arizona, which Travis, of course, it represents, you have to be able to sit at the table and when you vote, then you're more likely to be able to select or elect, I should say, those people who best represent your values. And they're more likely to sit at tables that maybe as individuals or Indian nations, you don't actually get to, but they sit there for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, having a seat at the table, of course, um, increased congressional representation. Uh, it's a shame that we're in a sort of just a bipartisan system, whereas in other, like in Canada or in New Zealand, where we have a more sort of parliamentary and, and blocks that form, a small group of native, uh, you know, Congress members could certainly wield more power, but um, the reality is a little bit different here. Um, yeah, I think it's just something to consider. And I, I, um, I wonder if those women in the 1920s are influenced. I mean, they had to have been by like Clinton Ricard and, and people right there, Chief Descahe, who's who's rejecting Canadian state claims to power and going directly to the League of Nations. So, um, I don't know. I think we could we could think more expansively about the vote and 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 what it means and and if maybe Sierra, you could Native people could bypass the American political system in favor of, you know, like staunch uh, indigenous nationhood. Uh, what that looks like, I don't know. And I think that the people are sort of theorizing and thinking about that, but um, mm. there's definitely a contingent that would say, no, we need to, um, we need to look to our own nations only and, and we don't want a seat at the table. You know, I don't know, there's no consensus on this, of course, but I think it's something to think about. Yeah, Dan, you were. I'll just say, uh those who oppose sovereignty, uh, those who want to get their hands on native land and native water, uh, they're all going to vote and yeah. <laughs> they're going to vote at, at, a, at a high rate. So sure. just, just keep that in mind. Uh, sure. They, they will elect their candidates of choice and they're not going to be native friendly can candidates. Yeah. I cast my vote, let me say, I, you know, I mailed in my ballot, I'm not saying that. <laughs> um, I think that now we should, we should leave some time for questions and comment from uh, our, our audience. There are many people here. Um, Laura, are you gonna? Yeah, um, I'll, I'll start it off and then along. I think okay. my, uh, my partner here, David, will, will take over. Um, uh, one of them, uh, which was really interesting, not that they all aren't, but, uh, 
Dr. Lim asked, uh, do the speakers see uh, the political parties ignoring of Native American voters as part of or a legacy uh, of a long history of indigenous erasure in the United States in US history? Um, yes and no, because uh, as, as, I mean, the, the literature shows, okay, certainly there's an attempt at erasure and ignoring um, indigenous people, but also, you know, seeking to silence them and, and push them aside. Yeah, that, that's a long legacy of, of colonialism and indigenous erasure. But um, equally important is when indigenous voters wield political power and sway elections, you often see the response by the political parties um, to silence the native vote. Um, it's it's in, in places like North Dakota, when it looks like there's going to be a huge voter turnout, that's when you see these types of things. And, and when a law is, is struck down and then and native people are mobilizing, then, then you know, they're gonna try something else and pass another horrible law. So um, I think it's also an, an effort at um, pushing aside a potentially powerful voting block that the, the parties fear as well um, because there is there is power there. Um, anybody else? Thoughts on that? I just want to add um, um, if you look at the map of Arizona and the location of tribes and how county lines are drawn, the county lines gerrymandered the tribes. The Navajo nations in three counties, the White Mountain Apache tribes in three counties, the Thanawatha yeah. nations in three counties. Those are huge land large based tribes with large populations that automatically can't participate in a meaningful way because the way counties are split. So any type of participation in county level decisions, and there's a lot of county de level decisions that affect tribes, yes. um, they, are, they are silenced. And I think there's even a, a, a court case, Dan, I think in the 1980s around um, a gerrymandering case, uh, I think in Apache County. But so there is a systematic dismantling of the native vote just based on the way the counties were drawn. And so if we don't try to address that, we're gonna have continued issues with um, uh, having these non-tribal communities make important decisions that affect our native communities at the local level. Um, yeah. So I don't think, it's not just a party issue. There's still a lot of systematic problems with voting that need to be addressed outside of this partisan discussion. Sure, sure. And then, uh, you know, the, the, the county issue is real, absolutely. And then there's almost like the, the added insult that they gave them the names of tribes, right? You got Apache County, it's like, <laughs> yeah, you did this and then you called it Apache County. It's like uh, Navajo County, you know, it's like it's adding its insult to injury. So it's, it's like, all right, um, somebody else asked uh, that uh, noticing the mainstream US me uh, media, including you know, the major news networks, uh, they've seen very little bit about, uh, about the current elections and Native Americans. Why do you think that is? You know, we were just talking about the overkill of get, you know, rock the vote and everything, so. So as a Westerner living in the East, I think it's because a lot of the that mainstream media is in the East. And for a very long time, Native people were pretty invisible, um, right? Where they were kind of all of the stereotypes, but also that the, the major population seemed to be out West, even though, as Mo, you referred to, sort of Maine, New York, North Carolina all have significant Native populations. But I think that there is a an Eastern centricness that sometimes means they don't pay attention to native people. Uh -huh. I think it's, I think it's, uh, I think it's a mixed bag. I mean, I see major news outlets um, with stories about native American um, issues and voting, um, you know, the net from the national, Ge I mean, the national geographic feature fe did a big feature on Deb Holland and Sharice Davids after they won um, their seats and um, 
it's been in the Guardian, you know, talking about disenfranchisement. Uh, mm -hmm. So it's even, you know, international news outlets. Um, McGirt has certainly made headlines, and I think discussions around that, and and Gorsuch being sort of a surprise uh, native ally. Um, so I think it's it's there's still a lot of work to be done, but I think it's it's definitely gaining in in the news outlets. I I would say, but you know, distance does make a difference, and New York based, Washington D.C. based outlets, you know, maybe don't focus as much on, on issues emanating from the West, that could be part of it. Mm -hmm. And no one's traveling to Indian reservations now because of COVID. Yeah. O Obama visited several Indian reservations. Nobody's doing that now. The, uh, the place where natives are involved in the discussion is where the three criteria are, are met. It's a, it's a very close race, uh, natives uh, appear to vote as a block, and the turnout is sufficient that it could actually make a difference in the election. And yeah. in a place like Montana, um, they meet two out of the three. Uh, natives are actually divided there. Uh, for example, uh, there's a lot of support for Trump at Fort Peck, including the uh, tribal uh, chair. Uh, <laughs> So, and, and there's very close races there for uh, the Senate. So th they're all actively courting the native vote in Montana as a result of that. Well, and I haven't, and I, so I can't speak really intelligently to this, but I've noticed, um, right, something's going on in the last couple of days with the um, Trump campaign talking about recognizing, um, is it the Lumbee? In North Carolina, right, and that has suddenly become um, an issue in the in the campaign um, because North Carolina is such a contested Swing place, state. Right? Yeah, mm -hmm. and, and the Lumbee Lumbee population Lumbee. is significant. Yeah, and they vote Republican. Yeah, huh? That's interesting. <laughs> They're meeting those criteria, Dan. That's what's happening right there. Uh, I'll give All us right. another question there. We have another question? All right. Um, this one uh, seems to be from a teacher here, uh, saying that they find it very difficult to break uh, their students out of the idea that the story of native voting is the same as that of women and other groups in US society, exclusion, struggle, rights gained. How do you teach or tell that broad story? Well, <clears throat> Read my book. That's one thing. <laughs> oh, <sorry. laughs> I mean, I think that historically, if you look at the history of indigenous enfranchisement, that it is not all like this, that it, it is peaks and valleys and ebbs and flows. And that um, also, if we look at the entire, you know, if we look continentally at Native American voting, and and during different empires, you know, indigenous people's rights under Spain were very different from those under the, the, the British Empire or the United States or France. And so enfranchisement can mean a lot of different things. And I would encourage you as a teacher to, to look at that. Um, you know, native communities are, are enfranchised uh, during the Spanish period in the Southwest in, in, in a number of ways. Mexico, when it's an independent nation in, in between 1821 and 18, the 1840s, the US-Mexico War, native people are citizens legally of the Republic of Mexico. And so they are enfranchised in that way and participate in, in political processes um, in a number of ways. And so I think that it's important to have a, a broader view of American history that, and a, a longer view as well that, um, you know, we're in a historical moment where um, the idea of rights and, and litigation um, and, and congressional actions, you know, in the last 150 years are really important. Um, but previous to that, indigenous people are lobbying for rights and enfranchisement and citizenship in different ways and gaining it, um, you know, native people. And it's not always just giving up uh, tribal status. You know, that isn't the only way historically that native people are becoming enfranchised. And so, I would encourage you know a, a broader conception of what enfranchisement means and a, a longer view 
both chronologically and um, geographically. I think that that's important and that's a way to teach it better. I would just add, I mean, it's hard because the native story doesn't fit kind of the narrative of really anybody else, right? The, the desire, the push for civil rights, um, right? Sovereignty is different. Um, and so, you know, the discussion earlier that the question that Maurice brought up about, right, what about not voting? No other group in the US really, well, some people do, but generally that's not a question, right? The, the vote is desirable, um, but it's different because of native sovereignty and the question of native nations having their own nationhood. Um, so that, the, this, it's not the same story. Um, so you have to, to think about it differently. Does voting endanger enfranchisement or, you know, or uh, sovereignty? Can voting endanger sovereignty? And sometimes it can historically, yeah. I think, I think Kathleen hit the nail on the head to, at the risk of overgeneralizing. The real difference is these other groups wanted to vote so they could become integrated. The reason why natives wanted to vote was so they wouldn't be forced to integrate. It was pr to protect their separateness not to fight for integration. That, that's a big difference. Yeah, protecting a distinct identity as tribal peoples, as citizens of indigenous nations. Yes. Um, yeah, good point. Oh, you're muted. You're muted, we can't hear you. Sorry, I didn't want to disturb anybody mm -hmm. while they were talking, see? Um, kind of a boots on the ground question. Is there information going out on a regular basis to tribal people living on reservations about what their voting rights are? Uh, if there is, is there good turnout? You know, do you see a correlation to that? So um, <clears throat> the Intertribal Council of Arizona has a pretty robust um, voting program. We, we follow the traditional um, voting campaign with first voter registration, get out the vote and election protection. And so we, um, because of the pandemic, we've switched everything over to on, um, online social media, email, um, traditional mail. And so uh, one of the, um, with, with regards to our election protection, work, we purchased um, voter safety guides, which includes a, a, a native vote bag, which includes a mask, um, hand sanitizer, gloves, and a pen. And um, voters can go to our website, itconline.com to request one, but we've also distributed them to tribal communities and included in that as a pamphlet that looks like this. Uh, which is um, a voting rights pamphlet to let them know what a voter's uh, rights are when they go to the polls. And then we just wanna make sure that they're um, voting safely. So we're hoping, and then we also have a 1-800 number, 888-777-3831. Um, voters can call our number. And if they have any questions about voter registration verification, polling location identification, or if they run into problems, any problems with voting, they can call our number. We'll have um, uh, trained lawyers available to do any legal intervention if needed. And then we'll have volunteers out in polling locations on tribal lands on election day. They'll pass out the safety voter kits and then just be available to provide any sort of voter assistance. So, um, and one thing that's new with our, our hotline is that we're able to provide um, voter assistance in Navajo, Apache, and Hopi. So we're very proud that we're able to provide that service um, for our people. Great. So we, we're doing the best we can. <laughs> uh, our capacity is a little bit limited because of the pandemic, but um, we're, we just we want to do what we can to to increase the native vote for this election. That's amazing information. Thank you so much, Travis. Uh, really appreciate it. Um, I think you know we're nearing the end. So if I could uh, get you know each of the panelists to have, you know, leave us with one takeaway, uh, what would that be? What would you, what would you sum up this, this discussion? Yes, my takeaway is, <laughs> is that, um, you know, this is the 100th anniversary of the women's suffrage amendment. Um, and I want people to, as they're celebrating, also think about sort of the 
the multiple experiences that women had um, and how the fight for the right to vote continued and continues um, right beyond 1920 for many women. Anybody else? Certainly I have, I have a takeaway. Is that, can you hear me all right? Yes. Okay. Is that this has really inspired me and brought uh, me to think about what can my, uh, what can I do? And so I would say that it's important, especially if for the indigenous people that are listening, that we continue to have conversations about voting and the importance of that after this election has gone by, that it remains a constant topic in a way that makes sense in the circumstances, but that it's not something that we just gear up just a few weeks before whatever election, but it is something that really is central to our lives. So that is something I'm taking away. Thank you. Thank you. And you know, the Arizona Historical Society, we need to know our history. We need to know the history of the native vote experience in Arizona and national. It's an inspiring story. It's a story of struggle. It's, it's a story about tribal sovereignty. And it's a story about um, how we're able to participate in the system like everyone else, but it took a long time to get there and we're still struggling today. And we need advocates, native and non-native advocates to support the native vote initiative. And so if you have friends who are native, you have cousins or whatever, <laughs> do your part to be an advocate um, in any sort of um, circle that you're part of, whether you're just a, a, you know, a community member, an elected member, uh, we need more advocates to advocate for the, for the native vote and the native voting rights in Arizona. Thank you. Dr. Crandall, I want to thank you so much for putting this together and allowing us to share all of these amazing stories and research. And uh, I have gotten lots uh, from the chat of how much people enjoyed this presentation. So uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Crandall, I'll, if you have anything to say, and then uh, I think we can, we'll have, we'll call it an evening. Yeah, I have one last thought and it's this. <clears throat> I think more native people need to run for office as well. Uh, and that's not that's something that we didn't really touch upon very much. But um, I've thought about it for myself, and I, I hate being a public person. <laughs> I mean, being a professor is hard enough, but uh, I could just imagine being an elected official. But Native people need to run for office, from school boards to um, you know county commissioners to uh, state legislatures, all the way up, um, and and. That would be something as we rock the vote, we should also be encouraging our rising generation to um, become involved politically and, and run for office. Um, and that, I think that that would boost, uh, you know, the protections that we can pro provide for our native communities, for sure. Thank you, great message. I wanna thank all of the participants uh, taking time out of your evening to, uh, to do this. So uh, for everybody at home, uh, my cohort always says drive home safely. So uh, drive home safely if you have to, <laughs> uh, or close your computer when you're done and make sure it's unplugged. So thank you again. Uh, please check AHS website for future programs. And once again, thank you uh, all of you for presenting, taking time out. I know you're all busy, so thank you so much. Have a great evening, and we will see you all soon, hopefully. Take care. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.